You're listening to the Unwritable Rant Podcast with your host, author, and occasional misanthrope, Juliet Miranda. Go to theunwritablerant.com and you can subscribe on iTunes or connect with the show on Facebook and Twitter. Hey there, y'all. It's Juliet Miranda. Welcome to episode number 90 of the Unwritable Rant Podcast. It's time to grab yourself a glass, fill it up with something delicious, raise it up, and let's toast. Cheers, y'all. Mmm, all right. Today, I am drinking Bernheim Kentucky Straight Wheat Whiskey. I'm a huge fan of weeded bourbons, so when I saw that there was a wheat whiskey available, something I'd never seen before, I was very curious. Now, I will spare you the technical distinctions between a weeded whiskey and a weeded bourbon, and instead just focus on this weeded whiskey. It's aged seven years, and it's a very light, easy-to-drink whiskey. And when I say that it's weeded, that means wheat is at least 51% of the mash bill. And that means this whiskey has a really light, smooth sort of flavor. Personally, I find it a little bit watery but it is incredibly easy to drink. At 90 proof, it's got a little bit of a burn to it, which is kind of surprising at first, but once it mellows out, you're going to find a really nice balance of a woody, molasses, and a little bit of a citrus flavor here. I'd have to say that if you're new to the whole whiskey thing, this Bernheim 7-Year Wheat Whiskey is a great way to go. And if you want to tame it just a little bit, add a couple of drops of water. It doesn't need a full-on ice cube or anything like that, just a little bit of water to open it up, and I think that kind of helps bring out some of the vanilla flavors to it. And I can also see how this would make an excellent mixer in a lot of whiskey cocktails. I am incredibly excited to say that it is, as far as I'm concerned, summertime here in the Midwest. We've had a string of consistent 80-degree days, and that means I have taken my little red wagon out of hibernation and am driving around town with a top down. I've said this before, I'll say it again, I am not the world's greatest driver. What I lack in driving skills, I more than make up for in being remarkably conscientious. So that means I'm always driving the speed limit, I go out of my way to avoid left turns, and generally speaking, I kind of take it easy out there on the road. Still, ever since I purchased my sports car, I have been pulled over more times in the past five years than I have in my entire lifetime. Our local police officers just cannot resist a convertible out there in the sunshine. Just last week, in fact, I was out running errands, had the top down, and within 10 minutes of leaving my house, the next thing I know, I've got a pair of flashing red lights on my bumper. Now, I have no idea what this guy wanted with me because as far as I knew, I was doing everything just right. So, of course, when you see those red lights flashing, your heart starts pounding a little bit. You get a little freaked out. I don't care who you are and what you have or have not done. It's always a little unnerving to have a police officer pull you over. So I do everything just right. I turn on my blinkers. I pull over to a safe area, turn off my ignition, and put both hands on the steering wheel so that I look like a very good girl who did absolutely nothing wrong. Well, out of that police cruiser comes one heck of a burly-looking guy. He's older, very no-nonsense, and stalks on up to my car, looking displeased. I immediately realize this is not a guy that I can flirt with, so I do my best to look as innocent as possible, which, for me, is a very difficult task because I'll tell y'all, I am always up to something. It's just a matter of trying to figure out what I'm getting caught for. He takes off his sunglasses and stares me down for a little bit and says those awful words. Ma'am, do you know why I pulled you over today? And I've got to look at him all cute and sweet and say, Why no, officer, I don't. And again, he gives me that sour sort of look and says, You were texting while driving. And for a minute, I panic and I think, Was I? Was I texting while driving? And I'm immediately annoyed with myself for being on edge and for allowing this guy to rattle me. Because I was not, absolutely not, using my phone while driving. I go out of my way to avoid using my phone during the day. Driving just gives me a legitimate excuse to ignore it even further. Not that the officer knew that, of course. 
which put me in an awkward position because I was going to have to disagree with him. And he did not look like a man who was going to take disagreement very well. So again, I put on my angel face, smile at him, and say, Officer, I understand that's a very serious offense, but I was not texting while driving. And oh, that does not make him happy. He squints his eyes at me and says, Ma'am, you had one hand on your steering wheel and your head was down. Really, dude? I was wearing a baseball cap and gigantic sunglasses. So how he knew where my head was was beyond me. But then it dawns on me. This guy's playing up a stereotype. He sees a chick driving a convertible sports car and banks on the fact that it is highly probable there is going to be a cell phone somewhere near her palms. Now, I am many things, and of course, I am a woman, and I am something of a lousy driver, but I am not someone who texts while drives. And I could prove it. I wasn't going to let this guy issue me a ticket for something I absolutely had not done. So I look at him and I say, Sir, that's impossible, because my cell phone is currently locked in my glove compartment. Boom. Well, he doesn't like that answer at all, and he takes my driver's license and insurance card and heads on back to his cruiser to run my plates, hoping that there is something he can write me a ticket for. And what do you know, my record was entirely clean. He comes back and begrudgingly sends me on my way, but not without issuing a very stern reprimand to keep both hands on the wheel next time. All right, buddy, I'll do that. Thanks. Now, mind you, I'm not disparaging our local police or police in general. They have an incredibly dangerous job and they risk their lives every hour. But in my town, our officers are a little bit more bored. And that is why that same day, when I was on my way home, guess what? I had another pair of red lights on my bumper. It was one of my town's finest undercover police cars. You see, I live in a rather quiet small town where very few things happen, so our local police force keeps itself busy by finding new and innovative ways to camouflage their vehicles so that they can catch people driving a couple of miles over the speed limit. This guy had done a hell of a job. I didn't see him coming at all, and I had no idea what he was after me for. All I know is that I'm pissed. This is the second time within two hours I have been pulled over. So again, I play by the rules. Ease my car off to the side of the road, put both hands on the steering wheel, and brace myself for whatever is coming my way. This time, it's a younger officer. One who is clearly proud of his uniform and likes showing it off. He swaggers on up to my car, doesn't take his sunglasses off, and is all, hey girl. And I'm like, hey, guy, officer, how do I respond to that? And then he doesn't start off with the usual, why do you think I pulled you over question. Instead, he asks me, how much did you pay for your car? And this confuses me. Is it a trick question? Does he think that I stole my car? I've never been asked that kind of thing by an officer before in my life, so I'm a little on edge here, trying to figure out the appropriate response that's not going to have me led away in handcuffs. And the worst of it is that I have no idea how much I paid for my car. I couldn't even tell you the year my car was made. I'm thinking, all right, this guy seems to have a little bit more of a relaxed vibe. Maybe I can flirt my way out of this one. I put on a damsel in distress kind of face, smile at him and say, gosh, I couldn't really recall what I paid for this car, but I do know I've got a whole year worth of payments left, and that sucks. And that leads us into a five-minute conversation about my goddamn car. I'm sitting there in my car on the side of the road. People are whizzing by us, half of them honking their horns and waving, laughing at the chick in the car who's gotten pulled over. And I'm sitting there having a discussion about how my car handles on wet roads. I can't figure out if this officer is just there to chat or if he's biding his time until backup comes. Finally, he gets to his point. And he looks at me and he says, Would you be interested in selling me your car? How is it even remotely appropriate for a police officer to pull a person over and ask to buy their car? But again, I don't want to piss this guy off, so I smile sweetly and say, well, it's not for sale now, but check back with me in the winter when the roads are icy. 
We have a good chuckle over that, and he sends me on my way, ticketless and confused and a little annoyed. And as I'm driving, I've got to wonder, what the hell am I going to get pulled over for next? Well, y'all, I'll tell ya. Ask a stupid question and you're going to get an answer. Just this morning, that answer came to me in the form of a ticket for noise violation. But I earned myself that ticket. I own it and I have zero regrets. Because sometimes, when the sun is out and the top is down, you just got to crank up the Neil Diamond. And with that, I'm going to raise up my whiskey and toast to Cracklin' Rosie, the bitch who just cost me 80 bucks. Uh, All right, whiskey. (laughs) You know, the more I'm drinking this Bernheim whiskey, the more I'm tasting a little bit of a buttery flavor to it. I'm kind of digging it. And I will say that I find it rather fantastic that so few of my adventures and the adventures I've had with my guy have resulted in police involvement. Of course, when it's just me or just me and my guy, there's only so much trouble that we can find. But when you up that equation and pair us with another couple, there is absolutely no telling the trouble that we will find. Not too long ago, we were out on the town with our closest friends, a couple that we've known for years, and they have the impressive distinction of being even greater troublemakers than he and I are. This is the same couple who once got us kicked out of a roadhouse. Few places are more tolerant of unruly behavior than a roadhouse, so you could appreciate just how impressive of a feat that was. Well, this time, we'd been day drinking at our favorite bar in Chicago, and we had only just stumbled out onto the street when we decided we needed food, and we needed it immediately. Now, this being Chicago at about 5 or 5.30 in the afternoon, We could get in a cab, but that would mean fighting rush hour downtown traffic. And with any luck, we'd wind up spending at least an hour waiting to get into one of our preferred favorite restaurants. Or, right there across the street, we could hope for the best in what looked like a fairly new Chicago-style steakhouse. Convenience won out. It always does when you've spent three hours knocking back bourbon cocktails. And, in this case, to our great misfortune... (laughs) The restaurant was open, and it had a four-top available, which seemed a little bit odd to me considering the time of day, but no matter. We all needed the food, and I am a chick who loves a good steak. This place had all the usual trappings of a steakhouse. The dim lighting, the dark leather, and a general atmosphere of having stumbled onto the set of Goodfellas. I did kind of have to question their choice of decor, however. Lining the walls were framed photographs of celebrities, headshots mostly, all of people who, as far as I could tell, had absolutely no connection to each other. Al Capone was hanging on the far wall, flanked by Katherine Hepburn and Woody Allen. All those random cheesy photographs gave the restaurant kind of the same feel as a convenience store somewhere out on Highway 65 between Louisville and Nashville. It was tacky, but trying real hard to be classy. Situated over our table was Jerry Lewis, a silent but poignant observer to our group. And if that wasn't an omen, I don't know what would be, because the next two hours played out like the single worst comedy of errors I have ever known. And it all started with my cocktail. What should have been a Manhattan arrived as a whiskey sour. Yeah, brace yourselves, y'all. Mistakes happen. I get that. But rather than fix it, The waiter asked, what's the difference, and suggested I drink it anyway. (laughs) My guy, our friends, and even Jerry Lewis on the wall knew that that was the absolute wrong thing to say to this bourbon gal. And for the next five minutes, I'll tell you, I schooled that waiter on exactly what the difference is between a whiskey sour and a Manhattan, and I suggested he commit that to memory thus making it official who the Dean Martin of our group would be for that night. Well, by the time he returned with my Manhattan, I was officially one drink behind the group. Which, considering what happened next, was probably a good thing, because I doubt that booze would have stayed put. Our appetizer had arrived. A sizzling plate of beer-battered shrimp. My guy was the first to grab a shrimp, 
but he did not bite into what he expected. We're watching him, and his hand is kind of shaking, and his face just goes white. He drops a piece of shrimp onto the plate, while sucking back what I'm sure was a good gallon of half-digested scotch from earlier in the day. What slithers out of that crispy beer breading is not a cooked shrimp. It is a raw shrimp, all gray and slimy and very clearly not deveined. The four of us, five if you count Jerry Lewis, recoil in horror. Had that thing oozed off the table like a slug, I would not have been surprised. And the waiter? Alarmingly unconcerned about the breaded salmonella ball he'd just served us. He grabs the plate and disappears into the kitchen for a while with a mighty sigh, as if we are so inconveniencing his evening. And he returned way too quickly. And by the obvious, suspiciously black color the food has taken on, I think it's safe to say that he delivered us the same appetizer, just run through the deep fryer again. Had we wanted to eat it, we would need to gnaw through a good inch of frizzled breading, which, by this point, more resembled a funeral pyre than anything edible. We wisely left that to molt on the table. It took an hour for our steaks to arrive. We spent the time plowing through several bottles of wine, which was the only booze we felt we had any control over. We even refused to allow the waiter to open the bottle. That's how much we distrusted this place by this point. And despite all of our drinking, I can't say any of us much felt like eating when our food finally did show up. We'd done enough complaining already and had gotten just disruptive enough to pretty much guarantee that at least one of our steaks had likely spent time connected to the bottom of the waiter's shoe. So all just kind of poking through the food on our table, jabbing at it with our knives and playing a rather loud game of Where's Waldo's Spit. My girlfriend is the first to decide that she has had it with this place. And she attempts to push her plate away from her, but finds that she cannot. The plate, it would seem, was somehow stuck to the tablecloth. Actually, that's not entirely accurate. The plate could be moved, but not without a whole lot of resistance, as if something is holding it up. So she grabs the plate, raises it over the table to look underneath it. And as she does, a large hunk of grisly raw meat that had been stuck to the bottom falls with a messy splat in the center of our table. That white tablecloth now looks like a large overused bandage. It had soaked up the worst of the blood and was now emitting a smell somewhat akin to cat pee. The situation is so gross and so absolutely vile that the four or five of us just devolve into this wild mashup of laughter and drunken shouting. People are staring at us. Other diners are getting thoroughly grossed out by the bloody smell coming from our table. And the waiter just shows up with his hands on his hips going, what now? Well, my guy gestures to the decimated meat hunk on the table and says, if you were going to bring a steak for Jerry Lewis, the least you could have done is cooked it. The waiter did not get the joke. And neither did the manager who likely didn't enjoy being summoned by our group when we started yelling, hey, lady, in her general direction. And she actually had the gall to accuse us of making a scene. Sure, we'd had quite a bit of wine, but that did not excuse the fact that this meal was an absolute tragedy. We were nearly poisoned by a raw shrimp. Raw meat was falling from the bottoms of our plates. What was next? And that, that's not even the worst of it. When we looked at our bill, we saw that not only were we charged for the wrong cocktail that I hadn't drank, we were charged twice for our appetizer. Well, you can imagine the ruckus that four kind of drunk, angry diners would make in a very small restaurant like that. And it took 10 minutes of volatile arguing and threats to call the local public health department before we got any sort of resolution. And it was a shitty one at that. The restaurant refused to take things off of our bill. Instead, they offered us free dessert and coupons for discounted appetizers on our next visit. Because clearly, we didn't get enough E. coli on this trip. Well, the manager and the waiter leave us to figure out what we're going to do about this bill. And we're sitting at the table and we've thrown a wad of cash on the table and even a 20% tip. 
because we may be incorrigible and we may be drunks, but we are not jackasses. But we didn't feel good about it. And we certainly weren't happy with the stack of bacteria coupons we'd been given. Jerry Lewis is staring down at us as we deliberate on how we can justify this situation and come out whole. Oh, you can imagine there is all sorts of crazy talk going on. We're thinking about stealing salt and pepper shakers, plugging up the toilets, starting fires, ransacking the hostess stand for all their complimentary mints, which is the one and only thing we felt safe eating there. But we didn't want to get arrested. That wasn't how we wanted our night to end. So I look up and whimsically say, what would Jerry Lewis do? Leave it to my guy to figure out exactly what Jerry Lewis would do. He didn't say a word. My guy just wrenches the photo of Jerry Lewis off the wall where it had been bolted. He tucks it under his arm like a good companion and leads the rest of us out of the restaurant. The man had eaten with us and he was going home with us. Now, I don't know if that's exactly what Jerry Lewis would have done, but I am fairly confident he would have approved. And with that, I'm going to have a little bit more whiskey, y'all. Hang on. Ah, there's my whiskey. And that means it's time for me to wrap things up with y'all today. Before I do, I just want to remind y'all to head on over to theunwritablerant.com and check out all of the great things I've got going on right now, including a comic book that I am starring in called Kindred Homecomings. And one more thing before I go, I just want to send a huge thank you to all of you for listening and to my Pottern Family podcast friends. Y'all are a bunch of maniacs. I'm looking at you, Bad Cop, Bad Cop, Robin Slim, Naked Porch Podcast. If y'all need some great listening, I highly suggest you check them out or check out any of the podcasts in the Potter and Family group on Twitter. As for me, I'm going to suck down a little bit more whiskey and head on outside and work on my tan. Hope you have a great week, y'all. Cheers. Go to theunwritablerant.com and sign up to get early access to interviews and new videos. You can hear new episodes of The Unwritable Rant on RadioVegas.rocks every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern and on IPMNation.com on Saturdays and Sundays at 6 p.m. Eastern and hear best of episodes every weekday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And don't forget to connect with Juliet on Twitter at Morning Neurosis. Yeah, he was pretty as a Sunday morning, standing on the corner at Carondelet. What you say we make a way up to Bourbon? A couple hurricanes and a hand grenade and get blown away. Let the chips fall where they may. If it's all the same, what you say, bon ton, yeah, pretty mama, I can smell the gumbo Sweetest taste of honeysuckle on my lips Good God Almighty, I can hear the trombone Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this Come a little closer, honey, let me hold you Nothing tastes better than a bourbon kiss You can be the flower on my magnolia Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this